So here's our definition, our working definition for expository preaching. I'd like for all of us to read this together. All together now, ready? Read. Expositor preaching is the exposition of one basic passage of Scripture which through an exegetical investigation discovers the original meaning and by theological reflection determines its application by the Holy Spirit first applies to the preacher who then by homiletical presentation delivers its message to effect change in the hearts of the listeners. And so that's the complete Apollos project, levels 1 to 3. So this is level 1, we try to discover the original meaning. Level 2, we want to, uh, where's the next letter? They determine its implication. Level 3 is deliver its message. All right? So those are the three Ds right there and uh, what we want to go through. So are you ready for phase one? Seven steps in doing exegesis. Step number one, all letter R's, read the passage like a pro. Read the passage like a pro. That's the blank in your notes. Read. Now, pro, of course, read it professionally. We make it into an acronym. Letter P is read it purposefully. Read it purposefully. You engage with the text. You bombard it with questions. You don't just read it casually. You read it purposefully. You know, our attitude when we're reading our Bible should not be like, you know, that attitude of an apple a day keeps the doctor away. You know, a chapter a day keeps Satan away. You know that kind of attitude? We need to be like investigative reporters bombarding the passage with issues, with questions. And so that's the five W's and an H. What's the five W's and an H? Who, what, when, where, why, and how. As many questions that you can come up with. So you ask questions like, uh, who wrote it? To whom is the author speaking? What is his purpose in saying that? When was it written? Where did, it, where did it happen? Why was there a need for this to happen? How did it happen? Again, all these questions. You don't have time to read, uh, to copy all of that, but there's the DVD. All right. I think we, we tried to burn some more. Meron pa ba tayong natirang DVD dyan? Meron pa DVD, DVD. All right. You know, it's almost like listening to somebody speak on the phone. All right? Listening to somebody speak on the phone. Uh, pero nga ng phone, kapatid. Yung phone ko nandoon doon eh. Yeah, medyo mamahalin to ata. So when you talk to somebody on the phone, when you listen to somebody talking on the phone, you can hear my voice, but you cannot hear the person I'm talking to, isn't it? All right? So that's the way you read the Bible. All right? So I'm talking right here, and you're trying to imagine what we're talking about through what I'm saying. So let's say, hello, good morning. Oh, congratulations, ah. Congratulations. What's the possibility? What's the possible options here? <laughs> Birthday, promotion, kasal ng anak, na divorce. I mean, in the, wag naman yung na divorce. All right. Congratulations, all right. Oh, is that so? What was the color? What was the color? Oh, you have to eliminate the other options. What's the color? So, bought a new car. <laughs> Maybe, yes. Dress, okay, what's the color? And then, he asked, Really? How many came out? How many came out? And so finally, you'll be able to get the fuller picture nanganak pala yung aso niya. And so, nanganak yung aso, ilan ang anong kulay, iba-ibang kulay, pastor, kasi ilang, ilan ang nanganak. So, when you're reading the Bible, it's like making that kind of exchange. You know, you can only listen to what the Apostle Paul is saying. You need to imagine what was happening on the other side. Bakit sinabi ni Pablo to? What was happening on the other side? You keep on eliminating the possible scenario as you continue to read. Alright? So, read it purposefully. Read it repeatedly. We want you to read it repeatedly. Remember 2 Timothy 2.7, reflect on what I'm saying for the Lord will give you insight into all this. Reflect. Continue reflecting on the, on the Word of God. And then we suggested to you yesterday, at least four translations would be good for you to uh, reread it from four translations. Remember, there are three the types of translations. There's the word-for-word, -word, formal equivalence. So those are the uh, word-for-word -word, 
uh, translations. Don't read King James anymore. Just read New King James. All right? At least we remove the archaic words. These are 1611 uh, words anyway. So New King James, you can read New American Standard Bible. That's a very good translation. And then, of course, you have the thought for thought, dynamic equivalence. And then we suggest that you read New Living Translation. Now, in between the word for word and thought for thought is the NIV. All right? So that's somewhere in between. And then, of course, we told you uh, to, you know, not so much use the paraphrase when it comes to serious Bible study. And so we suggested that you read New American Standard Bible, NIV, New King James Version, and then the NLT. That would be a good uh, mix right there, those four translations. And uh, we said wh what they did with the paraphrase, uh, you know, translation, the free willing translations, is again, they changed the metaphor, they changed the imagery, and so from the lamp, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. And so the Living Bible makes it, your words are a flashlight to light the path. And so again, uh, flashlight, that, that changes the whole uh, picture right there. Now you have to think of the battery. What battery did they use? And of course, some of the expressions that they use, they try to make it uh, contemporary. And you know, it, it debases in a way the word of God. So when Peter was scolding Simon for trying to buy the Holy Spirit, may your money perish with you, uh, in the Philip's translation, to hell with you and your money. And uh, that may sound like, you know, up to date and uh, the current uh, lingo, but friends, that's, that's uh, I don't believe that, uh, you know, it, it, it honors the Word of God. I don't think it honors the Word of God. And so yesterday, we showed you that there are the original writing of Greek is all capitalized letters and all the words connected. That's the Anshal manuscript. And then we showed you that several uh, years later, they, they, they uh, tried to write Greek, small letters this time, and then divided the words, the minuscule manuscripts. And so that means the first manuscripts to be destroyed are the Anshal, and then you'll have more, the uh, minuscule manuscripts, but in the history of the uh, King James Version, you have all minuscule manuscripts that's available for the King James 1611 translation. And so that's what they had for the Textus Receptus. And that's the basis for the 1611 King James Version. So only 25 early manuscripts, only uh, a, later, a few later Hebrew texts, and one text of the Septuagint that was available for them uh, at the time. And then... We showed you at the close of the uh, New Testament, 100 AD, 1611. So the oldest manuscript that they have to uh, translate from the 1611, all minuscule manuscripts, 885 AD. And then what happened was that 200 years later, in 1859, they discovered a, an older manuscript, this time an ancient manuscript. And so this was discovered by Tischendorf. And uh, there at uh, St. Catherine's Monastery on Mount Sinai. And uh, so this started a, a new uh, interest in uh, translating the Word of God with the Anshal manuscripts. So right now what we have with the Anshal, they try to put it together with the minuscule, you know, they try to make comparisons, reading there, the best reading here. And then they try to put the best reading and this is what you call an eclectic text. An eclectic text is the best reading from all these manuscripts. That became the basis for the Revised Standard Version. And then they found more texts. You now have the Nestle Allen 23. That became the basis for the New American Standard Version. That, then they have more new manuscripts, uh, better uh, readings. You have the Nestle Allen 25. That became the basis for the New International Version. They have better text that's coming out, you know, uh, b better critical tools. You have the Nestle Allen 27. That became the basis for the new living translation. And so, friends, what we're saying here, there's no one translation that is the best. All right? Because each translation, it was targeting a particular audience. You remember their English comprehension. That was the target. If your English comprehension is only grade 6, what translation should you use? The NLT. All right? And so, that's... Uh, so, re imagine this. By the time we have Nestle Allen 27, we now have 5,358 manuscripts and fragments and 800 manuscripts and versions of the Old Testament. Compared to the King James Version in 1611, they only had 25, 25 against 5,000 manuscripts. You have a better way to, you know, to see what was added and what was removed. So, you have a better way to get the better reading. Okay? 
So that's, uh, that's where we, that's how we see things here. So King James Version, New King James, it was targeting English comprehension of second year college, NASB, the target audience, fourth year high school comprehension, NIB, the target comprehension is first year high school, NLT is for grade six English comprehension. And so those four translations, I believe, will give you a better sense of what the passage is saying. Now, here's the clue. Here's the thing that will help you when you make this. You know those Bible, uh, those Bible uh, software where, where you have parallel translations? If you have four parallel translations, you can look at them. You can compare a lot better. Here's an example. Okay, here's the, uh, this one is just three. Okay, let's say Romans 13, 11 to 14. Let's say you're preaching from that. And then you begin to see some differences. Slumber here from the New International Version. New King James, you sleep. Uh, American Standard Version, you sleep. You know, you, they're translating from the same Greek word, but they came up with a different English translation. You know, they're trying to weigh which is better. So you have two out of three. Two out of three, so sleep would be better. Slumber, medyo slumber, medyo light sleep lang dating ng slumber, di ba? Sleep is talagang sleeping, all right? Anyway, you have their put aside, cast off, lay aside. Okay, those are just minor changes there. That's okay. But then when you come here, orgies, revelry, carousing, oho. You know what's the implication there? The Greek word is so rich. They cannot even translate it in one English word. They have to use three different words just to find the, you know what is really fitting to translate that word. So now you have a sense here, aha, that's a key word. I need to go back to the original word because even the translators are not agreeing on how to translate it. That gives you a clue already, that's a key word. That Greek word right there is very rich. They translated it in three words, orgies, revelry, carousing. All right? And then, debauchery, lust. Sensuality. Again, there's another Greek word there, different. But then look at this. Jealousy from the NIV. But the two versions here, envy and jealousy. You know, it seems like, I think there's a difference between jealousy and envy, isn't it? I mean, envy is wanting something that you do not have. That's envy. Wanting something that you do not have. But jealousy is the fear of losing what you already have. Did you get the difference? That's why God is a jealous God. It's a positive word. Because that's, you're losing what already belongs to you. Satan is trying to get your, you know, the wife that already belongs to you. So God is a jealous God. Of course, you can be over-jealous and that becomes negative. But again, do you see the difference there when you compare different translations? At least four. Four rows right there that would uh, give you a better sense of what the, uh, what the passage say. So again, we say, bombard it with as many questions that you can come up with and do this. What is Paul referring to? Do what? What to do? Uh, what do we need to understand about the present time? You know, if you read the passage, in what way are Christians asleep? What does it mean to wake up? You know, is this sleeping like in church? You know, during the service? You know what? I tell my people, it's okay if you really come to church and you just sleep. I tell people, do not disturb them. Because I believe that God can speak through dreams. You know? We, we don't disturb them. Yeah? You know, in the Old Testament, they believe that God speaks through dreams. And if you cannot have a dream in your own bedroom, you know what they do? They go to the temple. And in the temple, there would be quarters. They sleep in the temple, in the very house of God. And they expect that they have a dream from God in the very residence of God. And that started the time-honored tradition of coming to church to sleep. <laughs> no, don't pass that to others, okay? I just made that up, all right? I just made that up, all right? So don't tell people that's the original background to that. So you have there the words, urges, debauchery, dissension, jealousy, envy. How do we clothe ourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ? Make no provision. Do not think about how to gratify. How is this? That? You know, you bombard it with as many questions because... If you can come up with a question, your members can come up with a question. So you better have an answer for it because your members are thinking about it. All right? So that's when you do the preparation. Number three, the third, when we read, don't read it just purposefully, repeatedly, but read it observantly. 
observantly. You know, you give attention to details. You know, there's always a reason why the Holy Spirit would add a word or a description. And uh, tomorrow morning when I preach here, you know, just noticing uh, Joseph in the Old Testament. But um, I'll just talk about that tomorrow. So, purposefully, repeatedly, observantly. Now, let me test your power of observation. But before this, you know, the standard way of uh, doing uh, reading of the Bible, the OIA, I said this yesterday, O is observation, I is interpretation, and then letter A is application. So in the observation phase, you ask, discover what it says, interpretation, discover what it means, application, discover how it works. Okay, so that's, that's the standard way of understanding uh, the Bible. Now, many Christians... They go from observation direct to application. They, don't, they miss. They try to uh, skip interpretation, discovering what it means. And so a lot of times their application becomes OA. So that's what we're saying. It becomes overacting at times because their application was not warranted by the scriptures. All right? So let's read this together. Let's read this together. Ready? Read. Rest on good observation. Very important principle. Accurate interpretation and good and correct application rest on good observation. So let me test your power of observation. Again, those who have already attended the seminar, can you raise your hand those who have already attended the Apollo seminar? Come on, you're just... All right, these are the people. If something happens to me, they will take my place this afternoon. All right, it's good to have plan B, all right? So these people just raise their hands. But, uh, all right, so this question is for those who are here for the first time. Tell me, how many squares do you find here? How many squares? 17, all right. 13, okay. 22, yes. 24, 27, 28. 27. 57. Wow! Talagang you're looking at it uh, three-dimensional. Uh. Ginawa mong cube ata, kapatid. Eh. Alright, let's try to count this. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. 30 squares. Ah, 30 pala yung sinigil mo. I thought you said 13. All right, 30 squares. So, if you have a pastor who preached from a passage and saw 16 items, and you have another pastor preaching from the same passage who saw 30 items, What's the difference between Pastor A and Pastor B? The power of observation. The power of observation. And so how do we increase our power of observation? Anong dapat gawin natin? How do we increase the power of observation? Attend seminars, read books, listen to preachers, you know, just expose yourself to uh, different teachers and preachers so that you can expand your power of observation. You know, growing up, I keep, kept on listening to John MacArthur, listening to Chuck Swindoll, uh, listening to Warren Worsby. Uh, th those are my kind of trinity growing up, you know, in the Christian life. And just, I, I'm just so amazed how they can, you know, study the passage and then come up with these outlines, you know, come up with these observations. And, you know, they, they, they taught me a lot. Increase the power of observation. All right? And so, um, so step one, read the passage like a pro. And then, step number two, realize your subjectivity. Realize your subjectivity. Realize your subjectivity. So what we're saying here, friends, is that there's no such person who has no bias. We all are biased readers. Okay? 
when we come to the Bible, we have our biases, we, are, we have our stock knowledge, we have our issues, we have our questions. And so at least three biases, three backgrounds. Number one, we all have our personal biases. Write that down. That's, uh, the, that's the, what, the blank there in your notes. So we all have, uh, you know, our upbringing. We have our educational level. And that can uh, make a difference the way we understand the Bible. Number two, of course, is our cultural biases. You know, now for the past six years I've been living in Canada, you know, you can see clearly the, the, the difference between the Eastern mindset and the Western mindset. You know, Canada, just like, you know, just like the U.S., North America, it's highly individualistic society. And uh, even, you know, they, you have to respect the private space. Even when you ride the escalator, you know, when you ride the escalator, you, you, you leave one, one, one blank there and then the other person, because he has his space. If you're too close, you're invading my space. You know? They're, they're very conscious about that. They're here in the Philippines, dikit dikit tayo. Oh, sige, okay lah. You know? No problem. When you enter the elevator and you know that the, pe the people there, it's already enough space there, you don't just barge in, you know? Filipino lah, sige, siksika tayo dito. Walang problema. And again, th those differences in, in the culture is so, is so clear, is so distinct, you know, the, the, the family relationships. And again, you know, like the way they convince people, like this product, they say, the Chinese, the Eastern mindset, the way they would convince people of a product, they would say, you know, this product is very effective. This product has been in, in existence for the past 100 years. You know, you know why? Because it's very effective. That's the way Eastern mind would, would convince people. They look to the past. Now, the Eastern mindset, they would say, you know, this product is so effective. This is supposed to come out 2020. It's just 2015. This is advanced technology. <laughs> Very effective. The Western mind, they look to the future. The Eastern mind, they look to the past. And you can read the Bible. The, the Jews, they always keep on going to the past. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they keep on going back to the past. Because that's their link. And they don't want to be, you know, be separated from their past. In, in North America, you know, 18 years old, they want to be separated from their past. They want to be independent. They want to be on their own. They, you know, they can already cut all those ties. And, you know, if, if they have a bad experience in the family, they just cut all their ties and be on their own. In the Philippines, you know, our culture, it, it doesn't work that way. We always go to our past. You, yung lolo natin, yung lolo ng lolo natin. You know, we... We try to, as much, again, differences there, cultural biases. But of course, the biggest circle of all is our theological biases. If you grew up a Roman Catholic, that's the way you read the Bible as a Roman Catholic. If you grew up a Baptist, that's the way you read the Bible as a Baptist. If you grew up a Pentecostal, that's the way you read the Bible as a Pentecostal. So our theological biases can contribute a lot to the way we understand the Bible. So it's it's mental conditioning, you know, our, our past. Now what? We're not saying that your biases are all wrong. Please don't misunderstand me there. We're not saying that they're all wrong. But here's what we're saying. We need to just... Ano yung next letter R? We need to realize our subjectivity. We just have to, aware, to be aware that this is where we are. So that when we read the Bible, we don't impose our biases. Do you get that? Friends, listen to this. Please, I, I need to get your attention here right now. The biases that you are unaware of, the biases that you are not aware of, most likely will be imposed on the text. The biases that you are unaware of, most likely will be imposed on the text. And that's why we need to realize our biases. We need to realize our subjectivity. We're not saying they're wrong, but at least you're aware. Alright? So when you read the Bible, you just allow the Bible to speak for itself. And then that may mean changing your own biases. So here's the Bible. Here's the word, exegesis. The first two letters, the uh, preposition X, it means out of. So that means, Brad, diramin ko yung Bible mo dyan, Brad. Naiwan ko sa kwarto yung Bible ko eh. Ay, huwag naman yan, sobra. All right. So, yung X out of ibig sabihin the meaning 
should come from the text out of the text. That's exegesis. So the meaning should come from the inside going out. So that when you read, you are the salt of the earth, the word salt from the inside going out, you know it's potash. Alright? It's potassium. It's not sodium chloride. That's what the intention was. That was the Lord Jesus Christ was talking about. The word salt there is not sodium chloride. So exegesis from the inside, you're taking it out. The meaning. Taking. Now the opposite of exegesis is exegesis. A is the first three letters means into. Alright? Into. So the meaning, it came from your brain and then you impose it on the text. It's coming from the outside and then it's coming in. That's AC Jesus. So when you read, you are the salt of the earth. The word salt from your mind is sodium chloride and then you put the sodium chloride inside the Bible. So that becomes AC Jesus. So your own definition, you're, you're imposing it on the text. All right? So uh, again, if you're a Baptist, you know, your Baptist mindset, you impose that on the text. If you're different denomination, you, that's, that's what happens. So again, what just needs to happen is we need to be aware, all right? Just we need to be aware of our biases. Okay, let's have some sample here. Okay, here's the passage that we just looked at. Let's, uh, let's have a break at uh, five minutes from now, okay, 10.15. So okay, let's read this together, please. Ready, read. We first believed the night is nearly over, the day is almost here. Not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how the desires of the sinful nature. So again, we just have to uh, be aware of our biases. So first thing that would come out here since, you know, I grew up a Baptist, but now in Canada, I'm a Pentecostal in Canada. You know what? The Lord has just opened uh, many doors for me. I've noticed that wherever I go, Africa, Europe, and especially in the Middle East, 90% or close to 90% of those attending the Apollos Project seminars are Pentecostals. I mean, those of us in the evangelical side, our strength is more on the Word. All right? But, you know, we lack the vitality. You know? The presence of the Holy Spirit where, you know, He's moving in ways that beyond our expectation, we're, we're kind of, we need to experience that. And so I decided if I carry a Baptist tag, you know, these people will not even invite me. And so I decided it was a conscious uh, decision, I'm going to align myself with the Pentecostals. So I'm now part of the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada, PAOC, and that's the, that's the counterpart of Assemblies of God in America. And so PAOC opened up the door for me to go to Cuba. You know Cuba? There are 6,000 churches of the Assemblies of God Cuba. 6,000 churches. And they asked me to conduct a seminar last year. 120 pastors were there. When they heard about the seminar, because it's the PAOC who sent me there, they said, Pastor Roy, you come back this October. We want you to train 500 of our pastors in Havana this coming October. 500 Pentecostal pastors will be trained exactly what you're having right now. Can you imagine the kind of impact that will have in the way they study the Word? And so sometimes we, we try to, you know, try to use our denominational lines against each other instead of helping each other. You know, they have strengths that we can, that we can really gain from and we have our strengths that they can gain. So we need to do more cooperation in uh, many of these uh, uh, endeavors that we have. And again, as, I, as we mentioned to you, the DVD, uh, you know, part of the... Uh, uh, the donation there will go to Nicaragua. This coming July, 200 pastors, Nicaraguan pastors from the Assemblies of God, Nicaragua, will go through this seminar. And uh, that, that's, the, that's the thing, because I have to spend for everything. I have to spend for my airfare. I have to spend for my hotel. I have to spend for their manuals. I have to spend for feeding them for three days. 
I have to spend for their pen to use for the writing on the manual, and then I have to send them some money when they, got, when they go home. Because you took them away for three days from their job because they only received $20 a day, uh, a month as a pastor. $20 a month as a pastor. How many pesos is $20? About 800 pesos or something. You know? And so, again, uh, you know, this is the type of ministry that we need. I mean, there are some ministries like Middle East, I have no problem. The Filipinos there, when they have the seminar, we just have one offering for Pastor Roy. It covers for my airfare, it covers for my hotel. You know, they're, they're very generous. But we need these funds for these countries in South America. So we've opened up Cuba, we've opened up Nicaragua. After Nicaragua, you know, we're just praying that the Lord will just open up South America. And so, uh, the next time I come here, I'll be preaching in Spanish. All right! <laughs> Praise God! <laughs> so, we need to be aware of our biases. So here, because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. You know, as a Baptist, that, that scares me. Because, you know, we've been trained once we pray to the Lord Jesus Christ, we're already saved. But here, it's in the present tense. Our salvation is nearer now. It's nearer. That means it's not yet there. It's just on its way. Paano kaya yan, ha? When we first believe. So you need to open up. You need to allow the Bible to speak for itself. And so there, I have a theological bias right there. I need to be aware of that theological bias. I, I need to be aware not to impose my bias on the text. Allow the text to speak for itself. And then, you read here, it says there, Drunkenness. You know, from Filipinos, sa atin, beer lang, drunkenness na yan. For Filipinos, yung conservative na Christian, beer lang, bawal na yan. Kasi may alcohol content na yan. But here in the Bible, they're really talking about, because they always drink wine in the Bible, but they're against the drunkenness that goes with it. And because their wine is sub-alcoholic, you need to drink the whole day to be drunk, to get drunk. Remember the... Uh, the Pentecost uh, incident, people, they, they spoke in tongues and people said, they're drunk, they're drunk. And you know what Peter said? It's only 9 o'clock in the morning. How can we get drunk? Why is that impossible? Dito, umaga pa lang, lasing na eh. <laughs> How could that be impossible? Because in their culture, their, their wine is sub-alcoholic. You need to drink the whole day. You get drunk at 6 o'clock in the afternoon. After drinking the whole day. But here, it's drunkenness. I went to Europe. They serve wine when you eat a meal. You know, red wine. And so again, I have there my, my cultural bias, probably. And then it talks about sexual immorality. Now again, dito sa Pilipinas, yung sexual definition of sexual immorality may be different from the definition in America. You know, in America, you know, it's okay. Kissing is just okay, you know. But here, holding hands, major sexual immorality na yun. The holding hands na kayo, ha? <laughs> sexual immorality na yan. Di ba? So, that could be different. I, I need to be aware of my personal biases here. So again, th this is just what we're saying. That when you read the Bible, be aware of your biases. Make sure that you don't impose your bias on the text. Remember what we said? Those biases that you're not aware of, most likely will be what? imposed on the text. So just be aware and let the Bible speak for itself. Now let me just tackle just the first one, the theological bias. You know in the Bible, you find salvation in three tenses. You find it in the past tense, in the present tense, and in the future tense. So you are accurate biblically when you say, I have been saved, I am being saved, I am going to be saved. Now the past tense of uh, salvation is what we talk about justification for it is by grace you have been what? You have been saved. So we talked about I've been saved from the penalty of sin. That's the past tense of salvation. It's been paid for. Jesus Christ said on the cross, it is finished. Alright? It's been fully paid. That's what it means. It's been fully paid. Bayad na. Wala nang magpapapako sa cross. Tapos na. That's the past tense of salvation. But then the Bible talks about the present tense of salvation. And this is what we call sanctification. Kaya dito sabi niya, but to us who are being saved, who are being saved. So right now, we're still being saved from the power of sin. Yung penalty, it's been dealt with. The penalty has been paid. But the power right now, we're still being 
saved from the power of sin. All right? And then, of course, it talks about the future tense of salvation, and this is our glorification. In Romans chapter 5, verse 9, how much more shall we be saved? Now, this is the tense, this is the sense that you find in Romans 13, 11 to 14. So it talks about, I will be saved from the very presence, from the very practice of sin. All right? So there's no conflict there. It's just a different context. It's talking about the future tense of salvation, which is glorification. Okay, so here's the question that we all need to ask. Are you ready to, uh, to read this question? Ready, read. You know, that's easier said than done. That's easier said than done. Because if your salary depends on your position and your denomination expects you to carry on the same beliefs and yet you study the Bible and, and it's different, are you willing to change your bias because you believe it's the truth? That's the issue there. Sometimes it boils down to economics. Are you willing to give up your salary because of what you believe? All right? And so again, read the past like a pro. Realize your subjectivity. Just write this down and then we'll take a break. Retrace the historical background. Retrace the historical background, the, the third letter R. Let's take a 15-minute break. Uh, we have some announcements before you stand up. All right. Thank you. 